Coming up in the next one hour. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancels high-level Israeli delegation's planned visit to Washington after U.S. abstains from U.N. resolution calling for Gaza ceasefire. Hush money case continues to haunt Donald Trump. A New York judge sets April 15th as the trial date. Odds that Trump will face at least one verdict before facing voters on November 5th increase. New Zealand joins UK and the US in accusing China of cyber espionage. New Zealand says its parliamentarian entities in 2021 were a victim. Russian president says radical Islamists carried out concert attack, suggests Kyiv may have played a role. Ukraine denies any involvement. Death toll from the attack rises to 139. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has officially cancelled an Israeli delegation's visit to the White House this week. In a post on social media platform X, the Prime Minister's office said that the decision was made in light of the change in the U.S. position. The U.S. decision to abstain on the vote prompted Israel's Prime Minister Netanyahu to cancel a scheduled trip to the U.S. by two of his top advisers. The U.S. abstention on Monday's vote allowed the latest resolution on Gaza to pass, when the other 14 members of the 15 Strong Council voted yes. The resolution put forward by the 10 non-permanent members of the Security Council demands an immediate ceasefire for the month of Ramadan, the immediate and unconditional release of hostages and the urgent need to expand the flow of aid into Gaza. Jordi Jacobs tells us more on this. Just before that vote, Ramesh, because I wanted to explain to you those unusual scenes, because minutes before the meeting actually got underway, we saw this huge huddle of top diplomats inside the council with last-minute negotiations, because the push here from the elected 10 members of the UN Security Council was to ensure that this vote does not get vetoed by the United States, even though they had said on Friday that the intention was was that they don't agree with the necessarily agree with the resolution or the language thereof, but they participated in the negotiations which took place over the weekend. And of course, um, as you've now been reporting, that resolution is now passed. What it ultimately calls for is an immediate ceasefire for the remainder of the month of Ramadan. So there's about two weeks left of Ramadan. An immediate ceasefire now needs to be implemented. Also, there's a line that calls for the immediate release of all of the hostages, which now needs needs to be um, undertaken and then unimpeded humanitarian access in to Gaza. Now, we also know this comes on the back of reports yesterday um, by the United Nations where they said that Israel has now decided that they're going to block all aid going into northern Gaza. So, of course, this legally binding document, which is a UN Security Council resolution, which is the only legal um, sort of binding document from the United Nations is now going to force Israel, of course, to ensure that, um, that, that the ceasefire, together with Hamas, is implemented, that Hamas releases all of the hostages, and, of course, that they don't impede any further access of humanitarian aid in, into Gaza. The resolution goes a step further in saying that this is obviously the first the first part of it, but ultimately the end goal here is for a sustained permanent ceasefire within Gaza. The White House said that it was very disappointed by the decision of Israeli Prime Minister. The National Security Council spokesperson, John Kirby, said the Biden administration is kind of perplexed by Netanyahu's decision to cancel a planned Israeli delegation's visit to Washington to discuss alternatives to an attack of the southern Gaza city of Rafah after the U.S. abstained on a U U.N. ceasefire resolution. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller said that Netanyahu's statement was a bit surprising and unfortunate. There were issues where that we had concern, uh, issues with which we had concerns related to that resolution. The fact that it did not condemn Hamas's terrorist attacks of October 7th. That's why we didn't uh, vote for it. 
But the reason we didn't veto it is because there were also things in that uh, resolution that were consistent with our long-term uh, position. Most importantly, that there should be a ceasefire and that there should be a release of hostages, which is what we understood also to be the government of Israel's position. So uh, it is a bit surprising and unfortunate that they're not going to apparently attend these meetings. TV India correspondent Akshay Dongri joins us to get us more. Akshay, good morning. Help us understand this resolution better. How binding is it? And what does it mean for the war? What next to be expected? Well, uh, Preeti, under the uh, Article 103 of United Nations Charter, uh, the UN, UN Security Council resolution takes precedence over any other uh, resolution uh, of any uh, <coughs> member state of the United Nations. So uh, that makes it clear that once uh, the United Nations Security Council has passed a resolution, it has uh, to be followed by the member states of all the United Nations members. And uh, Israel being one of the members of the United Nations, uh, the resolution that has been passed as far as the ceasefire in Gaza is concerned, that also becomes binding for uh, the state of Israel. Uh, now, uh, as far as the demands are concerned of this particular resolution, they include uh, a temporary ceasefire till the month of uh, Ramadan uh, and a release of all the hostages. However, it remains to be seen that whether uh, Hamas uh, is going to, in fact, uh, uh, obey uh, this particular uh, uh, resolution that has been passed uh, by the United Nations uh, and uh, whether Israel will be following it or not. Because uh, while there are legal consequences, it remains uh, to be seen that what exactly is going to happen on the ground because despite the repeated calls for a ceasefire uh, in, the, in this particular conflict that has been going on, Israel has maintained one thing uh, that we are not going to stop till the time we have absolutely dismantled uh, the network of Hamas in, uh, that is operating uh, from uh, Gaza. Uh, so that uh, remains to be seen. But uh, as far as this resolution is concerned, it has come out as a huge victory for the people of, uh, of Gaza who have been calling, uh, or rather the government of Gaza as well, that have been calling for a ceasefire given the fact that number of casualties have been consistently mounting up in the past five months. There have been repeated calls for ceasefire, not just from the countries of the Middle East, but countries from around the world. In fact, India being one of the countries that has been uh, calling for ceasefire in, in Gaza as well, as far as uh, the conflict is concerned. And now, with the United Nations Security Council being uh, uh, persistent with, uh, in fact, following uh, that persistent demand that has been uh, raised by the, by, by the uh, government of Palestine uh, or, or the other members nations uh, of, of Middle East, uh, now it remains to be seen that how and when and how soon uh, the implementation of a ceasefire will take place given the fact that at very, uh, uh, since, since uh, the last five months, uh, continuously uh, uh, operations have been carried out by the Israeli government against Hamas network inside Gaza that have in fact uh, led to uh, a collateral damage uh, to the people of Palestine, uh, uh, to the, to the uh, buildings there, to the infrastructure there and so on and so forth. So at least till the month of Ramadan, there will be uh, some respite to the people if uh, this is immediately implemented by the Israeli government as well. Um, all right, Akshay, how do we, uh, or for that matter, how do you gauge the abstention of a U.S.? Now, we've seen that U.S. has been very vocal uh, with regard to, uh, to the developments in this war. Uh, why this change of heart? How do we understand it? Well, uh, we have to understand the domestic politics of the uh, United States as well, Preeti, because uh, while on uh, one hand uh, there has been a, a, a set of uh, senators, uh, of congressmen who have been calling for a ceasefire, there has been a, a divide inside the U.S. Congress or the Senate as well, as far as uh, the both parties are concerned, the Democrats and the Republic, uh, on, on what happens and what is going to be the stance of the U.S. U.S. has been one of the most uh, important allies of the Israel Israeli state. They have been one of the closest allies of Israel and uh, since uh, uh, since the attack uh, on Israel took place uh, in in the month of October last year, uh, we have been seeing that the United States has been uh, has been uh, vetoing all the resolution that have been put forth uh, by the United Nations Security Council. But uh, gradually, what you see in the past five months since uh, the continuation of the operation and it gets stretched, uh, the public perception in the United States is changing as well. Now this is uh, the domestic part of it. We have we are go going to see elections in the U.S. The presidential elections are just around the corner. They are going to take place this year, uh, besides the domestic politics and the, per, um, and the changing perception, there is international pressure as well. So while the United States is one of the uh, world's largest uh, country uh, in terms of military power, in terms of, of soft power, hard power, uh, but it has also to keep in account that it has other allies in Middle East as well, either it has other allies across the world as well. And uh, the world right now uh, has been calling for, uh, in fact, majority of the world has been calling for a ceasefire. And uh, while the US tried to resist that pressure for 
for a very long time in fact in the past five months it seems uh, that and now increasingly the perception uh, is is uh, solidifying that there should be a ceasefire and there should be uh, the, the humanitarian laws that has been taking place in Israel should be avoided at all costs and that uh, seems to be the reason why US has abstained so that is important US has still not uh, uh, voted in favor of uh, this particular resolution uh, because uh, there are certain languages that the US wanted to be included uh, that was uh, terming Israel as a terror organization and uh, the activities that were carried out as terrorist activities uh, while uh, it, it did not uh, get that and that is why the abstention took place but we have to understand that uh, the foreign policy and, and, and the uh, stance of US has changed to an extent that uh, they are saying that uh, ceasefire has been their persistent demand as well and that exactly is the reason why we are seeing the significant or rather paradigm shift in the policy of the US as far as this particular conflict is concerned Preeti. All right Akshay we leave it here and we'll have to see how the days ahead pan out. Thank you so much for joining in with those details and that analysis and explanation. Israel's Defense Minister Yov Gallant said that Israel could not end the conflict with Hamas while there are still hostages in Gaza. The Israeli Defense Minister is on a visit to U.S. where he is expected to meet his counterpart Lloyd Austin, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken and other senior U.S. officials. We have no moral right to stop the war while there are still hostages held in Gaza. The lack of a decisive victory in Gaza may bring us closer to a war in the north. We will operate against Hamas everywhere, including in places where we have not been yet. We will identify an alternative to Hamas so that the IDF may complete its mission. A veteran Israeli minister who joined Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's emergency unit government, unity government after Hamas's October 7th attack, resigned on Monday. Gidoin Zar, who, who joined the unity government along with several other members of the opposition to help manage the conflict, says he was not being included in the highest level war cabinet. Saar's departure, along with another of his allies, is not expected to affect the stability of Netanyahu's government, which still controls a clear majority in parliament. Donald Trump's criminal hush money case is set to go to trial on April 15th. The former president's legal team wanted the trial dropped or substantially delayed after federal investigators released a batch of documents they deemed relevant to the case. But in a win for Trump, his bond in a separate civil case has been substantially reduced. William Denslow gets us details from New York. Donald Trump and his legal team headed to court here in Lower Manhattan on Monday, hoping uh, that the criminal case he faces uh, tied to allegations that he paid hush money to a porn star in the lead up to the 2016 presidential election would be dismissed or at least the trial would be substantially delayed. March 25th was originally the date planned for that trial to begin. However, uh, recently, a little earlier this month, the judge delayed it by 30 days. This came after a huge tranche of court documents were released by a federal investigators. Now, Donald Trump's team said that the handling and the late release of these documents were grounds for the case to be dismissed. The judge didn't see things that way. Instead, he decided to keep uh, his ruling as it was after his initial revision, which means that April 15th will be the first time, uh, will be the first of Donald Trump's four criminal cases that he faces to go to trial. Donald Trump has denied wrongdoing in those counts, pleading not guilty to all 34 felonies that he faces in that regard. However, he was granted somewhat of a win on Monday. Recently, Donald Trump was ordered to pay around $450 million after he was found liable for fraud. However, an appeals court here in New York has ruled that instead of having to pay uh, that amount, he now has to pay just a $175 million bond while his appeal continues. Donald Trump has 10 days to make that payment. He says he will do. He has railed against these cases here in New York, as well as the various other uh, civil and criminal cases that, that he faces. He says that it's election interference, and he says it's essentially a product of the justice system becoming weaponized to hurt his re-election campaign. William Denslow in New York reporting for DD India. You're watching DD India News Hour. We're headed for a short break, but after the break, Ukraine continues to reel under the crippling aftermath of the war. Engineers leave no stone unturned to restore power to the households in Kharkiv and Odessa. U.S. Supreme Court to decide fate of abortion pill. 
Mifepistron. And endangered species including snakes, frogs and a crocodile are the new centre of attractions at the London Zoo. Voice of a rising aspirational world. Stories of challenges, struggles and accomplishments. A world battling conflict, hunger and poverty. Embracing growth, development, science and technology. A voice of progress, a voice of unity. Watch Voice of the Global South with me, Akshay Dongre, only on DD India. Welcome back after the break. You're watching DD India News. Uh, let's get to more international updates. US and British officials on Monday filed charges, imposed sanctions and accused Beijing of a sweeping cyber espionage campaign. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden on Monday accused Chinese hackers of trying to break into email accounts of British lawmakers who were critical of China and said a separate Chinese entity was behind the hack of its electoral watchdog that compromised millions of people's data. In response to the attempted hack in 2021, Britain imposed sanctions on two people and one company linked to state-backed Chinese hacking group APT31. Britain also said an unidentified Chinese state-affiliated hacking group was behind a separate 2021-22 cyber attack on Britain's electoral commission. I can confirm today that Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two malicious cyber campaigns targeting both our democratic institutions and parliamentarians. First, the compromise of the United Kingdom Electoral Commission between 2021 and 2022, which was announced last summer. And second, attempted reconnaissance activity against UK parliamentary accounts in a separate campaign in 2021. The New Zealand government said it had raised concerns with the Chinese government about its involvement in a state-sponsored cyber hack on New Zealand's parliament in 2021, which was uncovered by the country's intelligence services. New Zealand's Foreign Minister Winston Peters said in a statement that foreign interference of this nature is unacceptable and we have urged China to refrain from such activity in the future. The revelations that information was accessed through malicious cyber activity targeting New Zealand's parliamentarian entities comes as Britain and the US accused China of a wide-sweeping cyber espionage campaign. Russian President Vladimir Putin acknowledged on Monday that last week's deadly attack at a concert outside Moscow was carried out by radical Islamists. He, however, suggested that the shooting fits in a wider campaign of intimidation by Ukraine. It is absolutely clear that the terrible crime committed on March 22 in the capital of Russia, this is an act of intimidation, as I already said. And immediately a question arises, who benefits from this? This atrocity may be just a link in a whole series of attempts by those who have been at war with our country since 2014 by the hands of the new Nazis Kyiv regime. And the Nazis, as is well known, have never hesitated to use the dirtiest and most inhuman means to achieve their goals. Four men of Tajik origin were remanded in custody on terrorist, terrorism charges at Moscow's Besmeni District Court on suspicion of carrying out the attack, which was the deadliest attack inside Russia in the last two decades. Three others, also of Tajik origin, were remanded in custody on suspicion of complicity. Islamic State has said that it was responsible for the attack. The death toll has risen to 139, with 182 people wounded. The shooting took place when four men burst into Crocker City Hall on Friday night, spraying bullets during a concert by the Soviet-era rock group Picnic. French President Emmanuel Macron has said that it would be cynical and counterproductive for Russia to blame Ukraine. Macron added that the gunmen concerned were part of an Islamist group that was behind foil attempts to attack France over the past few months. This attack was claimed by Islamic State and the information available to us 
to our intelligence services as well as to our main partners indicates indeed that it was an entity of the Islamic State which instigated and executed this attack. We must refrain from all types of instrumentalizing. I think that it would be both cynical and counterproductive for Russia itself and the security of its citizens to use this context to try and turn it against Ukraine. Ils ont tenté. Meanwhile, the United Nations Security Council held a minute of silence on Monday for the victims of Moscow attack. All the 15 Security Council delegations stood and joined in, observing a minute of silence to present its condolences and sympathy to the government and people of Russia and in the memory of the victims of the heinous and cowardly terrorist attack at the concert hall. France has said that it will increase the number of soldiers for its Operation Sentinel unit, which deals with handling terrorist threats. France's Prime Minister Gabriel Attal on Monday said an extra 4,000 members of the military would be put on standby for the Sentinel Division, which guards sites such as the railway stations, places of worship, schools and theatres across the country. Earlier on Monday, President Macron said that the gunmen who killed 139 people in Moscow terror attack were part of an Islamist state branch that was behind the foiled attempts to attack France over the past few months. A quick update on the ground situation in Ukraine now. Engineers continue to work round the clock to restore power on Monday to households in two Ukrainian cities of Kharkiv and Odessa. Officials warned that damage caused by repeated Russian strikes on energy infrastructure could take years to repair. President Zelensky has urged residents of Kharkiv to look after themselves and their neighbours. Kharkiv is Ukraine's second largest city and a frequent target of Russian strikes. While in Odessa, Ukraine's top private energy provider DTEK has introduced emergency power cuts. Russia attacked Ukrainian generating and transmission facilities last week and over the weekend causing blackouts in many regions. Senegal's president-elect Bazirao Domai Fai, a political newcomer popular among the dissatisfied youth, promises to govern with humility and transparency. Fai is set to be declared the next president after his main rival called him to concede defeat. He thanked President Macky Sall and other candidates for respecting Senegal's democratic tradition by recognizing his victory well before the official results. Provisional results showed Fay with about 53.7% and Amadou Ba from the current ruling coalition with 36.2% based on tallies from 90% of the polling stations in the first round vote, the Electoral Commission said. The Caribbean nation Haiti is still in the grip of widespread gang violence as armed gangs set fire to several vehicle ga garages in the country's capital, Port-au-Prince. Now, according to local media, at least 100 cars parked in several garages were set on fire by armed gangs on Sunday night. The arson attacks also targeted mattress and furniture warehouses as well as a building housing a local court. The Caribbean country faces a surge in gang violence that has killed thousands, a wave of attack, this month has included raids on police stations and the international airport, which has led to the suspension of commercial flights. Belgian farmers are expected to protest with tractors in Brussels during a meeting of EU agriculture ministers, hoping to calm anger sparked in multiple EU countries about environmental standards seen as too strict and also foreign imports. Ishan Gurk tells us more from Brussels. For the third time this year, tractors have rolled onto Brussels streets. Tuesday's protest comes just as agriculture ministers of the European Union are meeting in Brussels. Farmers' unions say despite recent concessions made by European officials, they are still being treated unfairly. The EU has recently watered down some of its environmental norms for the agriculture sector to reduce the burden on the farmers. But protesters say that only benefits some richer farmers. They're asking the EU for more subsidies in a way that increases their profitability. They're also against the bloc's trade policies, which they allege could flood European markets with cheaper imports. This comes just a day after New Zealand announced that its FDA with the EU will come into force in May. The EU is currently working on another trade deal with Latin American countries, including agricultural powerhouses Brazil and Argentina. Farmers say it could render the small agri-businesses in the EU uncompetitive. 
for months, farmers across the 27-nation bloc have been holding demonstrations against their national government policies and also against the EU's green laws. As the June European Parliament elections approach, far-right parties are expected to capitalize on the farmers' anger. Now, EU officials say they are committed to improving conditions for farmers, but the protesters argue EU's policies haven't gone far enough in ensuring they get a fair price for their produce. Ashan Garg in Brussels, reporting for DD India. Farmers in, in Britain protested in London on Monday over food imports. A convoy of tractors drove outside Britain's parliament to protest against post-Brexit trade deals and substandard food imports in the latest demonstrations by farmers globally. Farmers with union jack flags and signs such as no farmers, no food, no future were demanding that the government should take steps to improve the country's food security. The rally follows protests by farmers across Europe who are angered by competition from cheaper imports and want stricter environmental regulations. Over 100 Nigerian students and staff who were kidnapped earlier this month were freed by the army on Sunday. They arrived at a local government building in Kaduna on Monday. The army announced on Sunday that it had rescued 137 hostages in the neighbouring state of Zamfara days before a deadline to pay 1 billion Nigerian currency, that is Naira, as ransom for their release. They were kidnapped earlier this month. School officials and the residents put the number of students kidnapped in the town of Kuriga at 287, while Governor Ubasani put the figure at over 200. United Nations aid chief Martin Griffiths plans to step down at the end of June for health reasons. Griffiths is a British diplomat who has headed the Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs since 2021. In a post on X, Griffiths said that he had informed Guterres of his intention to step down in June but did not provide a reason for his decision. Griffiths had previously served as a UN Secretary General Special Envoy for Yemen and as an advisor to all the three of UN Secretary General Special Envoys for Syria, among other roles. A quick look at other stories making it to the headlines from across the world now. Migrants and activists <coughs> held a memorial ceremony on Monday ahead of the first anniversary of the deadly fire at a Mexican migrant detention center. <coughs> Last year, on 27th of March, a fire broke out at a detention center run by Mexico's National Migration Institute in Suadad, Juarez, killing 40 people. U.S. Department of Homeland Security agents searched properties connected to hip-hop star Jean Didi Combs in Los Angeles and Miami on Monday. Combs has been accused by a former girlfriend in a lawsuit filed in federal court in November of engaging in sex trafficking. A Russian spacecraft, Soyuz MS-25, with three astronauts, including a Russian, American and a Belarusian, successfully docked with the International Space Station on Monday. The three astronauts joined seven other NASA astronauts at the station. Snakes, frogs and a crocodile took center stage in a new exhibit opening at London Zoo. There are 33 different species, many of whom are very threatened in the wild. Among those endangered are the mountain chicken frog and the Laos Wati Newt, which the zoo has successfully bred on location for the first time. Up next, a quick break. But after the break, External Affairs Minister Dr. S. Jayshankar winds up his three-day visit to Singapore. Stay with us to know the takeaways. Amidst the pole fever, we tell you ahead the unstinting contribution of Indian women in shaping the nation's political landscape. And strawberry farming is giving a new lease of life to self-help groups in the Indian state of Odisha. Wherever news breaks, whatever it takes. Connecting corners, cutting across continents. Stories that matter from across the globe. Accurate, authentic journalism that serves you right. From politics to glamour, from sports to world affairs, with a fusion of aesthetics and substance. 
Introducing news in a new avatar. Experience the world through a new lens. Stay tuned to DD India for an exciting journey beyond borders. Welcome back after the break. You're watching DD India News R. A quick relook at the top stories once again. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu cancels high-level Israeli delegation's planned visit to Washington after U.S. abstains from UN resolution calling for Gaza ceasefire. Hush money case continues to haunt Donald Trump. A New York judge sets April 15th as the trial date. Odds that Trump will face at least one verdict before facing voters increase. New Zealand joins US and UK in accusing China of cyber espionage. New Zealand says its parliamentarian entities in 2021 were evicted. Russian president says radical Islamists carried out concert attack. Suggests Kyiv may have played a role. Ukraine denies any involvement. Death toll from the attack rises to 139. And now we get to you the latest on what's happening in India in the run up to the world's largest democratic election. As the election campaign for the 2024 general election keeps picking up momentum, controversies have also started to gather. Congress's senior leader Supriya Srinathe made derogatory comments against the actor and now BJP candidate from Himachal Pradesh's Mandi Kangana Ranaut which has created a huge political backlash for the Congress. The BJP has hit out at the Congress terming that Srinathe's Instagram post brings out the mindset of Congress and what they think about women. Several senior leaders of the BJP have condemned the derogatory comments made at Kangana Ranaut. However, the Congress is on the back foot and is trying to salvage the damage done. They are trying to blame a parody account of the Congress leader. Janata Dal Secular Party in Karnataka is all set to release its list of candidates contesting the Lok Sabha elections from the state. The JDS is likely to hold a core committee meeting at State President H D Kumar Swami's residence in Bengaluru. The regional party is contesting the election. in alliance with the bjp in karnataka the safran party has declared nominees for 20 seats and according to the sources it is expected to announce the names for the remaining 5 seats in a day or two polling for lok sabha elections will be held in karnataka in two phases on 26th of april and 7th of may Bharatiya Janata Party has released five lists of candidates for the upcoming Lok Sabha elections till now the Safran party has fielded some prominent faces in the upcoming polls as of now names of 399 candidates have been announced on the other hand the Aam Aadmi party is expected to hold a massive protest in delhi against the arrest of its convener and delhi chief minister arvind kejriwal Delhi Traffic Police has put in place traffic restrictions and diversions any violations of which will result in strict legal action including towing Dibendu Mondal is joining us with more Dibendu good morning we've just given a brief account of how the election uh, fever is gripping the country with election dates announced with campaigning in full swing uh, the leaders and the parties trying to woo the voters let us understand from you how do you gauge the political temperature soaring in the country Uh, well good morning preeti that's right you know we are just a couple of weeks in fact away from the first phase of polling which is on the 19th of april and of course you know election comes with a lot of uh, you know controversies as well and uh, what we have been witnessing since last evening is a major political controversy that has erupted due to a comment uh, made by congress leader shupriya shrinathe on her instagram account which for, uh, later she said that it was not her account and perhaps a rogue uh, uh, element had posted that from uh, that particular account but having said that you know it is it, it is the congress that is in the back foot currently and the bjp is leaving no stone unturned to attack the congress because of course it is a derogatory comment on uh, uh, you know kangana ranawat who has been fielded uh, by the bjp from himachal pradesh's mandi constituency so of course you know this is going to cost uh, the congress a lot of damage uh, has been done for the congress with that comment because of course uh, you know in an election season uh, such a comment is 
is not uh, taken lightly by any political party and, and each political party will try to uh, you know cash in uh, and and uh, you know try to uh, take benefit of that uh, so of course uh, that is exactly what is playing out in uh, the country with that comment made by a uh, women Congress leader Supriya Srinate on a women Congress candidate, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, pardon me, a BJP candidate from Himachal Pradesh. So, of course, uh, you know, this is going to be a major political issue in the coming days. Uh, however, having said this, you know, the Congress is trying to damage control uh, by, uh, by saying that it was not her account, but of course, uh, the damage has already been done. Uh, with uh, you know the amount of uh, uh, senior leaders of the BJP, uh, you know taking uh, every chance to hit out at the Congress, uh, you know by uh, by by picking up that comment of co and Congress is of course on a back foot, but but also uh, you know today a major uh, political uh, slugfest will be seen on the streets of Delhi, where uh, the Aam Aadmi Party is uh, holding a protest across the national capital uh, uh, since uh, their. Uh, uh, their chief convener as well as the chief minister of Delhi, Arvind Kejriwal, has been arrested and uh, they are trying to make a prove a point uh, in the, during this election season. But, uh, you know, uh, the BJP, however, uh, is firm on its stand saying that the CM should resign uh, because a chief minister cannot operate uh, his office from a prison. So, you know, the, the political drama in the capital, uh, in the, on the streets of the capital is going to unfold uh, today. And, uh, you know, of course, the Delhi police has made uh, adequate arrangements across the national capital to ensure that uh, there are no law and order situation that breaks out uh, in the national capital. But, of course, uh, you know, as you also uh, said that uh, the BJP has released a list of uh, uh, almost 399 candidates, uh, almost about 80 percent, in fact, almost about 90 percent of the seats that the BJP will be uh, contesting. But of course, uh, the BJP has not released a single uh, name for the, uh, for the state of Punjab. Uh, however, Punjab goes to polls on the 1st of June. So, of course, there's ample time left for the BJP to dwell on the, uh, on the, sta on the uh, candidates for the state of uh, Punjab because uh, uh, what we are being told is that the BJP is trying to uh, stitch an alliance with the Akali Dal in Punjab and once that alliance, uh, if, at, if at all it goes through, uh, so then, uh, you know, the BJP would be able to uh, uh, put out the list of candidates from Punjab. But apart from that, the BJP has almost finished uh, the declaration of candidates uh, from almost all the states across India. Yes, back to you. All right. Yes, Dibindu, that was about preparations, that was about controversies. But uh, elections generally are also, uh, you know, marked by permutations and combinations, different options that are available. Let us understand from you, how are the polls this year, this time around, different from the ones uh, that were held previously? You know, how are the polls different from the ones held in 2019? Uh, well, Preeti, you know, uh, the, the 2024 election is being fought on the high pitch of development by uh, the yes. BJP. The Congress's house is not in order, uh, but the BJP has started preparing for the polls uh, for, from a very long time. And I've been covering the BJP for quite some time, and I know uh, the details and the nitty-gritties it has been uh, undertaking since the last one year uh, for the preparation of the general elections of 2024. And the BJP is very confident that it is coming back to power. But on the other other hand you see the uh, the congress is not able to uh, has not been able to release uh, the list of candidates uh, it has just released uh, if i'm not wrong about 120 candidates so far uh, while the bjp has almost finished declaring the uh, almost 90% of the candidates of course the bjp is playing at the front foot while the congress and the opposition alliance is on a back foot uh, the opposition has not been able to stitch their alliance together uh, still and their uh, and and their ho house is still not in order so of of course, the BJP is at an advantage, but uh, if we compare it with the 2019 election, uh, the BJP this time around seems much more confident than it than it was in 2019. But uh, having said this, you know, in 2019, the results saw that BJP winning the highest ever tally, uh, and of course, the BJP is expecting to win. Uh, the number of seats which is more than uh, what it was in 2019 and the Prime Minister has set a target of 370 seats alone uh, for the BJP. And uh, you know this time around also the alliances that the, uh, that the NDA has been stitching right. around is, is, uh, is pretty interesting. Uh, while uh, you know uh, the Congress's alliance uh, that the Congress is trying to stitch alliances uh, in multiple states is falling apart. So of course, yes. uh, you know the opposition clearly seems to be disoriented at this moment. Uh, while uh, the ruling BJP is playing at the front foot. All right, so we will see how the day is ahead and the poll contest again again uh, pans out. Thank you so much, Dibendu, for joining in with those details.
And India, holding the title of the world's largest democracy, is about to embark on its next general elections. This time, the spotlight is on the institutional con contribution of the Indian woman in shaping the nation's political landscape. Let's take a look. As India, the world's largest democracy, gears up for the upcoming general elections, the spotlight shines on the powerful participation of Indian women in shaping the nation's political landscape. From the beginning of the constitution, Indian women have been granted the right to vote, which is the cornerstone of democracy. However, the actual turnout of women voters has often been lower than that of men. Various factors, including socio-economic issues, may have led to this situation. But now, the tide seems to be turning. The gender gap in voter turnout has significantly reduced in recent years, with 65.63% of women exercising their right to vote in the 2014 parliamentary elections, demonstrating the growing political involvement of Indian women. In 16 out of 29 states, more women turned out to vote than men, highlighting their substantial influence in shaping the nation's political landscape. In the 2019 Lok Sabha election, which was a historic moment in the country's post-independence era, 77 women were elected as members of Lok Sabha. Additionally, there are over 1.45 million of 46% women elected representatives in Panchayati Raj institutions, surpassing the mandatory representation of 33%. The 73rd and 74th Amendments, 1992, to the Constitution of India have reserved one-third seats in the Panchayat and municipalities for women. India is presently one of the only 15 countries in the world with a woman head of state. Globally, India has the largest absolute number of elected women representatives in local governments. Also, for the first time, women voters outnumbered men in the southern Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Similarly, the participation of women in Indian politics is on the rise. On 19 September 2023, India's Prime Minister introduced the historic Nari Shakti Vandan Abhiniyam Women's Reservation Bill, which seeks to provide a 33% quota for women in Lok Sabha and state assemblies. It can only come into effect after a delimitation based on a census conducted after the bill has been passed with the next delimitation scheduled for 2026. As India prepares for another historic election, the women of this diverse and vibrant nation are set to make their voices heard once again, proving that they are an integral part of the democratic fabric of India. Sujata Lochab, DD India. After wrapping his three day Singapore visit, India's External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar reached Philippines on Monday evening. During his visit to Singapore, the minister had several bilateral engagements with the leadership and senior Singaporean ministers. During the meet, the views were exchanged on deepening engagement in the identified pillars of cooperation, including fintech, digitalization, green economy, skills development, and food security. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar also met his Singaporean counterpart, Vivian Balakrishnan discussing bilateral, regional and global issues of mutual interest. During his visit, the minister also paid homage to Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose in Singapore. He met members of the Indian community and interacted with them. The visit presented an opportunity to further deepen the strategic partnership between India and Singapore and to take stock of progress in several areas of cooperation. After Philippines, the minister will also be traveling to Malaysia to drive bilateral relations and discuss regional issues. A quick look at other stories making it to the headlines from across India now. Strawberry farming is giving a new lease of life to self-help groups in the eastern Indian state of Odisha. The farming there is increasing their income and improving the quality of life in the rural areas. Indian politician K. Kavita's custody with the Enforcement Directorate will end today. She was arrested by central agencies on charges of being a key conspirator and beneficiary of the Delhi excise policy scam. 
Delhi Chief Minister, who was also arrested by the ED in excise case, is in custody till March 28th. A quick break ahead, but after the break, Boeing Chief Executive and Chairman David Callon steps down. In fact, he will be stepping down. Virat Kohli's 100 T20 half-century spear Royal Challengers Bengaluru to a four-wicket win over Punjab Kings. And we show you a Tiger's majestic jump to cross a river at India's Sundarbans. Welcome back after the break. You're watching DD India News Hour. In more international updates, the fate of a commonly used abortion pill will be considered by the US Supreme Court on Tuesday in the High Court's first abortion case since it overturned the constitutional right to an abortion nearly two years ago. Kate Fisher gets us details from Washington. Well, the outcome of this case could have far-reaching consequences for access to abortion across the country, as well as potentially invite ideological challenges to other approved medications like contraception and COVID-19 vaccines. A Christian conservative medical group that opposes abortion rights, the Alliance for Hippocratic Medicine, has argued that the US's Food and Drug Administration did not adequately study the safety risks of mifepristone and it acted unlawfully when it relaxed the rules surrounding its use. But in legal briefs, medical professionals have described the drug as among the safest medications ever approved by the FDA. Medication abortion has become increasingly common, with more than 5 million women in the US using mifepristone for abortion since its approval. Six in ten abortions last year were performed through medication. That's up from 53% in 2020, according to research from the Guttmacher Institute. But a ruling against the FDA would severely curtail that. By cutting off access to the pill through the mail, barring telemedicine prescriptions and reinstating a seven-week limit on its use, even in states where abortion remains legal. Though hearings start this week, the Supreme Court's not expected to issue a decision until late June or early July. And while it's unclear how it will rule, its 6-3 conservative majority suggests that it may be inclined to uphold certain restrictions on mifepristone. In Washington, Kate Fisher reporting for DD India. Updates from the world of business now. Boeing's board has begun the search for a big hitter to take the helm of the troubled plane maker following the turbulent tenure of CEO Dave Carlon, with many industry executives and analysts predicting that it will seek an outside remedy. Facing mounting pressure from airlines, regulators and investors, Boeing on Monday announced a broader than expected shake-up with Carlon stepping down by year end on the heels of a company's commercial plane making chief and its chairman. The U.S. plane maker has been wrestling with a growing crisis following the January mid-air plane blowout on a 737 MAX plane. U.S. stocks lost ground at the start of a holiday shortened week on Monday as investors positioned themselves ahead of the inflation data. All three major U.S. stock indices ended the session in the red with a blue-chip Dow suffering the largest percentage loss. The dollar dipped as the risk of yen intervention loomed and it came under pressure from China's government-supported yuan rally. 
Oil prices were on track to gain for a second straight day on Tuesday after settling up more than a dollar on expectations of a tighter supply driven by Russian production cuts and attacks on Russian refineries. Brent crude rose 23 cents to $86.98 a barrel, while U.S. crude futures climbed 28 cents to $82.23 dollars. On to sports, we'll talk of IPL first. Virat Kohli's 100 T20 half century shepherd Royal Challengers Bangalore to a four wicket win over Punjab Kings in Bengaluru on Monday night. Chasing 177, Kohli made the most of an early reprieve when he was yet to open his account. The Indian star batter scored 77 to set the platform for RCB to get off the mark. Dinesh Karthik and impact player Mahipal Lomror provided the finishing touches at death to take RCB over line with four balls to spare. Punjab bowlers Harshal Patel, Sam Kuran and Arshdeep Singh wilted under the pressure. Earlier, RCB managed to keep a lid on Punjab, scoring all through the power play. Pacer Yash Tayal was impressive, hitting the right length and getting movement both ways. Skipper Shikhar Dhawan top scored with 45, while other batters made valuable contributions to take the visitors to modest total of 176 for the loss of six wickets. Virat Kohli notched up his 150-plus score in T20 cricket during Royal Challengers Bengaluru's IPL 2024 match against Punjab Kings in Bengaluru. Kohli got a reprieve on zero. He made the most of the chance and reached to a half century, which is the 51st in IPL. In T20 cricket, Kohli has scored eight centuries and 92 fifties. Out of these, one century and 37 fifties have come in international matches. Chris Gale leads the list with 110 50 plus totals in the format, closely followed by David Warner in second place, who has 109 such scores to his name. Kohli is at the third position. Chennai Super Kings are all set to take on Gujarat Titans in their next battle of IPL on Tuesday in Chennai. Both teams have already played once this season and won their respective games. Chennai beat Royal Challengers Bangalore by six wickets, while Gujarat Titans got the better of Mumbai Indians by six runs. Chennai are currently ranked second on the points table, while Gujarat Titans are currently ranked fourth. Both teams last played each other in the final of the IPL 2023. Chennai Super Kings were crowned champions after they defeated Gujarat Titans by five wickets. But in the five matches played between these two teams, Gujarat Titans have better record as they have won three games while losing two. The BCCI announced the schedule for the remaining fixtures of the Indian Premier League on Monday. The board had earlier released the schedule for only the first 21 games due to upcoming general elections in the country. The competition is set to resume with defending champion Chennai Super Kings taking on Kolkata Knight Riders in Chennai on the 8th of April. The board also announced the venues for the playoff fixtures. While the MH Chidambaram Stadium in Chennai will host qualifier 2 and the final on May 24th and 26th, respectively. Qualifier 1 and the Eliminator will be played at Narendra Modi Stadium in Ahmedabad on, Mar on May 21st and 22nd. From cricket to football now, the Indian senior men's team will look to grab full points as they take on Afghanistan in the FIFA World Cup 2026 and AFC Asian Cup 2027 prelim preliminary joint qualification round 2 on Tuesday in Guwahati. In their previous meeting just four days ago, the Blue Tigers were held to a goalless draw by Afghanistan on the South Arabian, Saudi Arabian soil. They moved up to the second place in the four-team Group A as Qatar beat Kuwait 3-0 the same day. But on home soil, India have netted 16 goals in the last 12 matches. After three matches played by each team, the double Asian champions Qatar lead the points table with nine points followed by India with four, Kuwait with three and Afghanistan with one. The top two teams in the group will qualify for round three of the World Cup qualifiers and book their berth at the 2027 AFC Asian Cup as well. Top seed Carlos Alcaraz dominated Gael Monfield 6-2, 6-4 and fourth seed Alexander Zverev escaped a tight first set en route to a 7-6, 6-3 win over Christopher Eubanks to reach the last 16 at the Miami Open. Alcaraz is on a quest to capture the Sunshine Double after his triumph at Indian Wells and the 20-year-old was never really threatened in a match of two of the game's most entertaining players. The Spaniard appeared to be cruising to the finish line when he served for the match leading 5-2, but Monfils rifled a forehand winner to break and extend the match.
The comeback would prove short-lived, however, with Alcaraz deploying a textbook serve and volley on his first match point to seal the win with a love hold. Alcaraz, who won the tournament in 2022, will next face Italy's Lorenzo Massetti. Caroline Garcia pulled off a gritty 6-3, 1-6-6 to upset of third seed Coco Goff to book her first trip to the Miami Open quarterfinals. French woman Garcia's serve was clicking early and she never faced a break point in the opening set before Goff raised her level to even the affair at a set apiece. In the pivotal first game of the deciding set, Garcia took a 2-0 lead and did not re relinquish against her 20-year-old American opponent. Next up for Garcia is American Daniel Collins, who beat Sarana Christia 6-3, 6-2. Also, fourth seed Elena Rabakina powered past Madison Keys 6-3, 7-5. Rabakina was more efficient than Keys, winning just over 80% of her first serve points during the 84-minute encounter. Rabakina will next meet a well-rested Maria Sakari after the Greek 8 seed got a walkover into the quarterfinals. Rabakina owns a 2-1 record in the head-to-head -head meetings with Sakari. Spotting tigers is already rare and thrilling, but witnessing the big cat jump into the air is an even more extraordinary experience. A video of a tiger taking a giant leap to cross a river at Sundarbans National Park West Bengal is winning the hearts on the internet. That was indeed huge. And with that, we end this edition of DD India News Hour. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X and also Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Preeti Kaur signing off. And from all of us here in Delhi, thanks for watching DD India News Hour.